Good morning, Online Church. Welcome to this week's service. It is so good to have you all tuned in here today. This week, we have a super special service. We have Nathan Chester from our Huon Valley location joining us and giving us a powerful word on yes and amen. And also this week, we have the Celebrate Nations Choir. So get on your dancing shoes, get up off your couch, wherever you're watching it, and get ready to join in for this incredible service. God bless. to dance turn to someone next to you and said are you ready to dance turn to the other person the other side and said are you ready to dance we are going to dance this morning we are going to shake off all the problems hallelujah his promise is yes and amen so today we are going to dance because he's alive he's risen hallelujah he is risen! Hallelujah! Thank you. Giving all honor to Jesus. Giving all honor to Jesus. Giving all honor to Jesus. Giving all honor to Him. Giving all honor to Jesus.
I just want to share the Bible passage with you. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19. It says, God is not a man that he can lie. If he says it, he will do it. If he says it, he will do it. If God tells you to walk to Jericho, the walls of Jericho, those walls are coming down. If God tells you that he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Are you ready to dance? One, two, one, two, three, go. was part one we're gonna do part two are you ready we are going to dance this song we're about to sing the celebrate nation compose it it's in my language in creole it said no matter the circumstances you will make it no matter the difficulties you will make it the devil is a liar when you walk in this door this morning, whatever you have, leave it here in the feet of Jesus because he's risen. He's not dead. He's alive. Okay. Are you ready to dance with us? It's, it says, I will make it. Say, I will make it. That's what it says in English. Let's go. Come on. Jesus, 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 Jesus,
But I, I say that because uh, I've got the absolute privilege now to introduce to you uh, Nathan Chester, who is going to be coming up and preaching this morning in our nine o'clock. Nathan and his wife, Narell, and family um, came across from Adelaide in, right in the middle of COVID. You actually probably would have known because they were on ABC and in the newspaper, one of those families that moved in the middle of COVID. Uh, they felt a calling to come here and plant into the life of our church. And uh, they, they are instrumental in what we do in one of our services, which is down in the Huon Valley at 2.30. They do an incredible job. But we are one church five services and so we don't want to hide you know Nathan from what he's preaching down there as well so would you just give it up for Nathan as he comes up to preach the word thank you Sean good morning look at all these beautiful smiley faces I love it hey I know probably 90% of you haven't met me before um, I'm from South Australia, I have a bit of a South Australian accent, you know, when we went back last weekend for a wedding and we had to come back with a, a few South Australian icons, who knows what a fruchok is? Oh yes, yes, fruchok, it's like a little bit of, uh, of fruit covered in chocolate, and it, it's, it's a lot better than it sounds, but <laughs> they, they, they are just beautiful, and yo-yos, who knows a, what a yo-yo is? Now, I'm not talking about something with cream in the middle. It's got a, this is actually a, like a biscuit. Anyway, in our carry-on luggage, we had to have yo-yos and fruit chocks to bring back because we love Tassie, but there's still a bit of a South Aussie thing in us that we're not going to shake, and I'm not ashamed of that. <laughs> you know, we've been uh, with the Huon Valley campus for, since we've... Campus, what is it? Location, sorry, Sean. Since we moved down in June in covid uh, we got locked in our house for two weeks to isolate and then we come and we got to meet the beautiful family down there. And this is, to me, this morning, being the first time on this platform, it's like when you, you go and meet the in-laws. <laughs> and, and you know it's all going to work out, but they're sort of like, who's this guy about? Where's he from? What, what's the deal here? Um, so you'll get a little bit about what I'm about. Um, and I'm just, I just feel it's a real honour and a privilege. Thank you, Sean, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak on this platform. Uh, this morning, I want to start with a question. As we're looking at the Yes and Amen, this is an awesome series we're looking at. And I want to ask you this question. I'm going to ask it to you many times in the next 20 minutes. It's, what will you do on the way to where you're going? What will you do on the way to where you're going? What will you do on the way to where you're going? Sometimes we get so focused on where we're going, we forget about there's actually a journey on the way that's just as important as the destination. And I want to look a bit at uh, the life of Joseph. In the, he lived about 4,000 years ago, so nice recent history. Um, we read about him in Genesis 37 to 50, and this guy had a good start to life. He was born in sort of a normal family, as normal as it can be with 11 brothers and four mothers. Now, for us, that <laughs> doesn't sound that normal, but for that culture, it was okay. And so he was living a normal sort of life. And then a few little things. There's only a few verses that lead up to this in Genesis 37, I think it is, where it says... Well, Joseph was actually a favourite. His dad loved him more than the other brothers. Okay, you can see there's a problem coming already. And so he gave him this beautiful coat of many colours. Now, this isn't like going down to Kmart and buying a nice rainbow T-shirt for 25 bucks. Oh, Kmart, sorry, 10 bucks. Um, this is, you know, having a coat of colours was a sign of, of wealth. It was something that was valuable. It was something that meant, you know, you're someone special. And so everywhere he was walking around with this coat, his brothers knew, okay, Dad likes him more than us because I've just got my beige, so my dirt-covered beige, which I use when I go out with the, the sheep and the cattle. And what's more, Joseph's dad said, well, when you go out, I want you to go and find out what the brothers are doing. Tell me all the goss. I want to know the bad stuff. 
I want to know the good stuff, but come on, come and tell me. So now his brothers not only were jealous of his coat, now they actually started to despise him because of what his dad wanted him to do. And on top of this, he had a dream. He had a beautiful dream, which I don't know if it was wise for him to share with his family or not, but it sounds like probably not. He dreamt, hey, brothers, hey, mum and dad, one day you're going to bow down to me. Isn't that exciting? And maybe he was expecting a good response, and um, it wasn't so favourable. But at that point, God put something in his heart, some seed for his future, something about what God was going to do in his life, something about where he was going. Where are you going? What's your direction? What's pulling you? I'm not going to unpack this more. I'm just going to throw some questions out for you to think about during the week. Like, is your direction set by trying to climb to some sort of corporate ladder? Is it about trying to achieve some sort of level of assets? Is it about some prophecy that was spoken over you that, that you're, you're walking towards? Some dream or vision or some talent that God's put inside of you that burns in you and you know, you know I've just got to do this for the next 10, 20 years, the rest of my life. What is actually steering you in the direction that you're going? And so Joseph, then, in this normal family, now he's got some weird dynamics in his family. Now he has these brothers. You know when you walk into a room, and just before you get there, there's two people talking, and they're getting really intense and sort of half tones, and you walk in, and they look at you, and it's quiet. And you're like, well, are they talking about me? They must be, because the conversation stopped when I walked in. This is awkward. And then, or, or they change the conversation suddenly. Oh, yes, yes, wasn't that a lot of rain we had the other day? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> and you know that just when you were walking up there, there was hushed tones. Well, this, this was the dynamic that Joseph was now in, in his family, is these brothers were sort of talking behind their backs, and they're talking about, Joseph this, Joseph that, he's a favourite, he gets to dob on us all the time. Now he's got this dream, he thinks we're going to bow down to him. So things are a little bit weird in his family. And what I want you to look at here, this was not an overnight decision. When his brothers were out in the field, Joseph comes, and that morning they woke up and said, what are we going to do today, boys? Oh, I don't know, Scrabble? Nah, didn't bring the board. Hey, I've got an idea. When Joseph comes, let's kill him. Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that today. That sounds like a fun thing to do. It wasn't a spontaneous decision that they made. This is something that was brewing for months, maybe years beforehand, while Joseph is 17 years old, and they say, you know what? I see an opportunity here. Let's get rid of him. Let's sell him to slave traders and send him off to Egypt. You know, years ago, I used to have an aquarium. <laughs> yes. I, I love my tropical fish. <laughs> That's it. I've got the endorsement of the senior pastor now. Here we go. And I had this fish full of all these beautiful... Sorry, this fish. This aquarium had these little neons. Who knows what a neon is? A tiny little blue fish... And, you know, most fish you buy in ones or twos, neons you buy by the dozen because <laughs> you, you just do. And you shine the light on, they glow in the dark, they're really cool. So I, I had all these neons, and then I got some, some um, mollies, like little striped and spotted fish, and some catfish, and I had about probably six or seven different varieties in my fish tank. And then one day I went to buy some more fish, and I bought two fish called Oscars. Oh, someone said, oh no, they know what it's going on. <laughs> Does anybody know much about an Oscar? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, there we go. They are super aggressive. So, so these Oscars, though, they were the same size as the other fish in my fish tank. And so I was really pleased. They just looked pretty. One was black and one was orange. Well, what you feed grows. And these little Oscars got a little bit bigger. And then I'd go and look at my fish every day, and one day I noticed, hey, one of my neons is missing. <laughs> and um, 
I thought, oh, well, you know, they die, sometimes they disappear. And then... <laughs> well, you know, they, they, can, they can die, float to the top and get stuck in a filter. So that's why I thought, maybe it's just one of those. But then another neon disappeared. And then within a the space of a few weeks, all my neons disappeared. And my Oscars were getting that little bit bigger. Over the course of the next uh, probably four to six months, every fish disappeared, <laughs> except my two Oscars, all eaten. And Oscars grow, so this started as a little two centimetre fish, and he ended up, both of these, at about 20 centimetres in my fish tank. They're big, and that was in the space of 12 months. These Oscars then have their own personality. If you have rocks that are too big in the bottom of your fish tank, they'll get them in their mouth, they'll spit it, at the window to get your attention, and they've been known to crack the glass of your fish tank. But these, these are not your average fish. They're, they're known as the dogs of the sea. They love attention. You can hand feed them, but they want attention. And so you put small rocks in so they don't destroy everything. However, I also had plants in my fish tank. I said, did. And they dig them up and they eat them and then they, they put all the stones on one side, and then there's a big hole in the middle. And then you say, well, I'm going to reset my fish tank. And so you put everything back. And a few hours later, no, it's like this. And so this whole aquarium became Oscar Kingdom. Why am I saying this? Because this is what was going on in the heads of Joseph's brothers. They had some thoughts there that started as small thoughts, and they fed them every day. They fed these thoughts of jealousy, they th fed the thoughts of hate, the envy, until everything else in their mind was gone, it was consumed by these thoughts. Because what you feed grows. You, you keep dwelling on the bad stuff, it's going to grow and it can overtake everything. So I return to this question, what will you do on the way to where you're going. Who here has ever heard of teenagers? <laughs> Few people know what they're about. You either have some, have seen some, have heard of them, you've read about them. I've got a couple of teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> Teenagers are Oscars. Well, that wasn't in my sermon notes, but uh, <laughs> no. Um, but you know, when sometimes you ask a teenager and you say, What do you want to have for lunch? Whatever. <laughs> what do you want to do today? Whatever. So I want you to just ask this question to the person next to you say, What are you going to do today? And you have to answer it with a teenage whatever. What do you want to do today? Oh, whatever. Well, I want to redefine the word whatever for you today. Let's read Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. I want us to get rid of the old whatever and replace it with a whatever. A whatever. What are you going to do on the way to where you're going? I'm going to do whatever. Not just do whatever. Oh, wherever I go, I'll go out for a coffee and then I'll sleep on the beach or whatever. Whatever. No, I, we need to get a purposeful whatever. What am I doing today? Today I'm doing whatever is right. Today I'm doing whatever is true. Today I'm doing whatever is noble. Today I'm doing whatever is praiseworthy. So we need to take these Oscars out of the fish tank. And we need to replace them with something. We need to get this fish tank back in order. 
by feeding the things that matter, by feeding the beautiful colours of character in this, this whatever verse of Scripture. Start feeding thoughts of truth. Start feeding things that are right. Start feeding praiseworthy thoughts. Start feeding the thankfulness in your head the, for the good things that God's given you. Let's get this fish tank back in order. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And in Galatians 6, um, 9 and 10 says, Let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is our whatever. On the way to where we're going, sometimes it can feel like we're putting all our attention to getting there. We, we, we have this vision of healing down the track. We have this vision of the family being united. We have this vision of finishing school. We have this fin vision of achieving a certain thing in our workplace. And in focusing so much on the end, we forget about the journey. We forget that every day we have an opportunity to do whatever. Because sometimes the destination can disappoint you. Sometimes you don't even get to the destination, as Sean preached a couple of weeks ago, like Abraham. What are you going to do on the journey? I'm going to do whatever. So let's just return back to Joseph quickly. Joseph was sold as a slave to Egypt. He was betrayed, left on his own, forgotten. His family now had, had secrets which they covered up. And then he gets into this guy's house called Potiphar. And in Potiphar's house, it says that everything, so that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. What was Joseph doing in Potiphar's house? Joseph was doing whatever. He was doing whatever his hands found, found to do. He did it as for God. Not as though he was serving a, a high official in Egypt, he did it as though he was serving God. And we see this as, as we progress through Joseph's life. He gets to a point where he's basically looking after everything in Potiphar's house, and then Potiphar's wife gets the hots for him and tries to seduce him. And he's left with an opportunity to make a decision. It would have been easy to give in. It would have been maybe a pleasurable thing to give in to her, but he already had in his heart a whatever, and his whatever wasn't just things he was doing, his whatever was also part of who he was. Good. I'm going to do whatever is right, whatever is noble, whatever is honourable, whatever is true. And so at this point, he decides, I don't know what the outcome of this is, but the, the honourable thing to do is to honour my boss, yeah. Potiphar, to honour my God, and I'm going to do whatever. And so he lived this life of integrity, and sometimes we think living a life of integrity means everything's going to work out okay. But it doesn't. Many countries around the world at the moment to live for, for Christ, to, to put your integrity on the line, your faith on the line, means imprisonment, it means death, it means ostracism. I think I messed up that word. Getting ostracized, there you go. And here, you know, we have it so good in, in Australia, we really do. But Joseph was prepared to make this choice. So he resisted temptation, gets accused of rape, thrown into prison. So now his life's gone downhill again. He's back in prison. He's there for about 10 years, almost forgotten. And you probably know the story, there's a butler and a baker and a dream and all this stuff. And when this, there's this butler there that gets restored back to be Pharaoh's butler, and Joseph says, just don't forget about me. Remind him that I'm still here and I'm innocent. And while he's in prison, He's doing whatever, and he's raising up the ranks in the prison, and so he's basically looking after the whole thing, but still, he's looking to get out of prison. I can see that. And he gets forgotten for another two years. So now he's, he's got to deal with hopelessness as well, and like, is this ever going to change? But there's still some, something in him that says, well, while I'm here, this might not be where I thought I'd be, or what I want to be doing, but I'm going to do whatever. And finally... He gets 
uh, he interprets a dream for Pharaoh and ends up second in charge of the whole country. It, it's a beautiful story. If I could have the musos up, thank you. So, but through Joseph's story, he had the same opportunity to, f- to foster these thoughts of evil, thoughts of complaint, thoughts of bitterness, and he could have fed those Oscars in his head until it overtook everything, but he decided, no, I'm going to feed thoughts of goodness, thought, thoughts of thankfulness, thoughts of faith, thoughts of nobleness, yeah. until that became the fruit of his life. Yeah. It says in Genesis 50, verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. He realized that underneath everything that was happening, God was in control. You know, in teleological ethics, there's this little statement that says, the end justifies the means. I think as a Christian, I just cannot subscribe to that because I will not put the end higher than God, honoring God through my entire journey. It's not just about getting to the end, however you get there, whatever damage you do on the way, whatever things you do on the way, falling off the, the train. No, I want, my journey is important. My journey is part of my destination. And I want to get there honoring God, loving people, and doing what He's called me to do. Dr. Martin Luther King said, the time is always right to do what is right. So what will you do on the way to where you're going? I just want to add one extra thing to this, which is really important. It's not just about doing the whatevers. There's something else we need to add to this. In God's Word, He gives us great and precious promises. In 2 Peter 1.3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. God's Word has in here so many promises for our journey. It's about the destination, but it's also about the journey. He's got promises here for help and for guidance. Promises to comfort us when things get tough. Promises of provision. Promises of hope. Promises to give us strength and power through the Holy Ghost. Promises of deliverance. Promises of healing. Promises of renewal. And His presence is with us. He's promised that He will never leave us or forsake us. He's promised His presence with us. He's promised His power through us. He's promised His favor on us. And He's promised His love inside of us. These are the promises that we hang on to. On our journey to where we're going, we have promises to help us get there. The Holy Spirit burning and enabling and giving us the grace to get there. We can't just do it on our own. We've got great and precious promises on this journey. So let's finish with this statement once more. And maybe you need to think carefully about what you need to adjust. What will you do on the way to where you're going? Not just, where are you going? No, what will you do on the way? Who are you going to help? Who are you going to honour? Who are you going to bless? Who are you going to help? And do it all honouring God. Serving Him. I just ask you to close your eyes. I want you to just have a moment between yourself and God. Just be raw. Open up your heart and let him see everything that's in there. Be real with him. And if you know that sometimes your journey isn't been one, hasn't been one full of honour, or your journey, you've forgotten to lean on the promises of God and you're trying to do it in your own strength, 
Maybe you've been so focused on where you're going, you forgot about the journey, the people along the way, the opportunities along the way to shine the light of Christ. Maybe we've let the Oscars in our mind take over until the fears have thrown out everything else. The bitterness has thrown out all the good stuff. And we've been feeding this. And maybe it's time to ditch those Oscars and start rejuvenating the fish tank of your mind with things that are honest, things that are true, things that are noble, things that are honorable. Just right now, just just spend 30 seconds with God and just say, God, this is the area I really need help with and I bring it to you. God, I want change. I want to honor you with my life. I want to honor you on the journey. Thank you, Jesus. maybe today you need to re-engage with God's promises on a new level he's given us everything we need for life and godliness we just got to walk in it and trust him God this morning you see us you see our hearts You know our journey. You know our destination. We just bring that all to you, God, and we ask that you would help us to walk an honorable life, a life of whatever, to honor you and those around us, to fulfill the purpose for which you've created each and every one of us. We just thank you so much for this moment with you, Jesus. Amen. Better you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. And into the darkness you 